opens things up here. Yeah, there's an attendee. All right, there, there we, we go. go. For any Twin Peaks fans on the call, I have a little Easter egg, the R&R &R Cafe mug. <laughs> <laughs> that was my latest binge in quarantine. I haven't been there yet. <laughs> oh, you got to do it. Yeah. The older one, the original, or wasn't there a newer one? You got to start with the original. There's two seasons, then there's a movie. Then according to Reddit, you have to do the deleted scenes before you go into the next season. Lauren's made herself a Twins Twin Peak expert here in the last two weeks. It's a serious investment. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> I mean, we have the time, right? <laughs> we really do. Hey, everybody joining. We'll uh, we'll give people another minute or two to trickle in here, and then we will get we'll get rolling. In the meantime, we're talking Netflix uh, rabbit holes, how to follow up on Twin Peaks, uh, fun activities to do if you do or do not have children. <laughs> we're running the full gambit as we get ready for this uh, webinar. All sharing how we locked our kids and dogs away for this hour. <laughs> to make this possible. That was the commitment we made. <laughs> made no possible matter. by bully and sticks and more. iPads. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren, have you picked your next binge? Uh, or is that still TBD? I think Jack Ryan. Okay. I think it's time. We just watched Extraction, so now I'm in this like heavy, violent action film stage, and I feel like Jack Ryan is a good follow-up. But open to suggestions from the, all attendees of anyone. Oh, casual. Thanks, Kelly. I actually know someone on casual, so I should be watching that. <laughs> I started to rewatch all of the community. I'm really into that now. So we just finished the first, good. our first viewing. Uh, I, uh, love, like loved it. Great, so, highly recommend. I never watched that much of it. It's really, ah, there you go. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> I just started watching Space Force. Anything with John Malkovich is usually excellent. So good. I saw that Just watched the first three or four episodes, but it's been good. It got horrible reviews, but it's already greenlit, thank God, just because of who's in it. So we're in for <laughs> season two no matter what. <laughs> People have thank more God. time. They're going to watch. Oh, for sure. All right, we are right at uh, 11.05, so let's get rolling. Uh, obviously, people can, can join uh, as, we, as we keep talking, but welcome to this virtual roundtable discussion coming to you live from the comfort of home offices, living rooms, maybe a bedroom or two, uh, but we're glad you're here with us. We're gonna be talking about a variety of topics for how best to drive growth in Q3, as this lovely title slide suggests. Um, to do that, we're gonna be talking to each of the panelists you see kind of in front of you today, um, what they've seen over the past few months, and ultimately you know, what, they, what marketers should be thinking about as we head into to Q3. Uh, this is going to be heavily discussion-based. We've got kind of two slides and that's it. So hopefully you've got uh, the majority of this hour to kind of be present with us. Our goal is to kind of be talking for about 30, 40 minutes. We have plenty of time for questions at the end. We've got already a chat or two for TV recommendations, but please throw your questions in there. Uh, if you want to ask it to any of us specifically or just to the group, you know, feel free to call that out. Um, outside of that, we'll plan to send the recording out afterwards. And I think that takes care of the intro. Uh, it does look like we're not in gallery view, so you can only see the active speaker uh, in case that we change it, which I think that'll be on each of us, one of us. We'll figure that out after we get out of the slides. Uh, okay, but that's the intro. Uh, we did want to have a variety of different perspectives included today, so I don't want to steal anyone's thunder. But in terms of the next slide here, if uh, I can get back into that. Awesome. Todd, you're on the left here. Why don't you kick us off? Tell us a little bit you know, who, about yourself, your company, your role within the company, um, and we'll start there. All right. Hey, everyone. My name is Todd Kreisman. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Media Radar. Now, Media Radar is a company that is best known for actually working with ad sales teams really helping sales teams know who is spending where and when and what is the right fit between you and them. But along the way, and we do that basically to, to give that insight, we basically have to collect all the advertising, whether it's in a podcast or on LinkedIn or whether it's in live television or something with programmatic and OTT. And so 
our our role in the ecosystem and for today's webinar is basically to have a real litmus test, a real understanding of where advertising is spent. Um, and we work with maybe about 2,200 different media companies today. Awesome. Michael, you're next. Sure. Um, so my name is Michael King. Uh, I've been working in digital marketing over 15 years now. Um, so a lot of what I've been doing is kind of helping strategize campaigns and build campaigns with uh, work with clients such as CBS, uh, Norton LifeLock, Callaway Golf, um, Live Nation, and Ticketmaster. There's a, a, an industry that really got hit hard um, with the whole stay at home orders in COVID. Um, I work at Media Math and we are an omni channel DSP. Um, we're integrated with Audience X and we allow for marketers to put the right message in front of uh, the right audience with efficiency and transparency. My role there is um, mainly business development, so working hand in hand with those clients to, and agencies to drive outcomes and fit, that fit their needs. Lauren, you want to round us out? Yeah. Hi, guys. I'm Lauren Hutton. I'm the VP of Growth over at Audience X, and we have the privilege of working with both Michael and Todd's companies on an everyday basis. We are a technology-enabled media solutions company. We work with advertisers, marketers, agencies, and help them um, you know, create and deploy omni-channel campaigns. And our solution set is everything from you know, integration and data infrastructure to actual campaign setup and execution, uh, all the way through reporting and analytics. So my job is really to help um, create customizable solutions for each of our clients and their individual business need sets. And in doing so, I have the privilege of working um, in a multitude of areas with a little bit of a high level um, you know, oversight on the different pieces of the industry that we'll touch on today and, and different pieces of the advertisers' um, needs as, as we go through this crazy 2020 year. <laughs> so with that, I'll pass it back to Joe. Yeah, thanks everybody. So I'm Joe Hoyne. I'll be kind of the moderator today. Uh, at Audience X, I work with either our, sell our sellers, our internal folks, our business partners, to ultimately help our clients succeed in whatever they're looking to do. And I'm happy to kind of talk to everyone through, through our presentation today. So let's jump out of the slides. I can stop sharing my screen. Um, first question, Todd, we're gonna throw it over to you. you know, what are you seeing and hearing you know, from marketers? Love the position you're in for this question, obviously, because you're gonna get such a diverse set of answers. Uh, but let's start there. Sure. So I think what's been most interesting to us is like all of us, all of us understood that there'd be certain categories of marketers who are just down and out, right? You know, travel being number one. But I think what really has surprised us is there is a group of people who are the unexpected beneficiaries of a pandemic, who looked at the pandemic as opportunity. And I, I'm not really just referring to folks like sell, you know, like Clorox or people selling masks or something. There are dozens of industry verticals who are benefiting. Some of them are benefiting in what looks like a real structural change and others are just here, you know, going to be in and out. But, you know, as an example, in the beginning of the pandemic, we saw a huge spike in toy advertising. Hmm. That's not even a category people talk about unless it's like the week in like right before Black Friday and here we saw them as if they were waiting around for a pandemic. They started marketing as if it were no, you know, late November through the middle of, of December. Uh, cereal companies, breakfast food companies, quickly, I mean, within a couple weeks, realized that the third of the population that went to an office and got their, their meal there was suddenly going to be eating home every day of the week. They jumped on that right away, and we saw... <laughs> like a two or 300% increase in spending that was right there in April, like end of March, right there in April. What's been interesting is, is that that has been mostly ephemeral, right? People like Michael and myself, we, went, we did go out and buy, <laughs> buy a lot of stuff right at the beginning for our families, our kids, but that also fades away a little bit and you create your new norm other categories, though, have been more sustained. So, for example, eyewear advertising. When we talk to these brands, they, are, they have had like 15 consecutive weeks of increased ad spend 
because even though we have all had computers on our desk for all of this time, we weren't staring at them so intently the way we are now. And so the sale of eyewear and especially for blue light to, to sort of to, to filter blue light out, which is harmful to you, uh, has, been, has, has been really interesting. So that has been one of the major takeaways is that there has been an evolution in the categories of who is really spending right now. And then we see also a lot of trial and error among the biggest companies, companies that can afford to, to change creative. The automotive market is in their third, fourth, or fifth iteration of creative messaging. We monitor all that. That is unbelievable to see the change, how much innovation that's going on for them. And everything is on the line. They're such a linchpin in the overall economy that they're, they're fully invested in it. But it is, it is quite different than, than what we would see certainly this time of year. Yeah, absolutely. And I can say the uh, test and learn for creative in the last maybe week or two, I don't know if you guys have noticed this. I've seen less of the in these trying times or yes. we know everyone's struggling. So I think it took until about now for companies to realize we should probably try some, some different messaging in some cases. Um, and so, you know, on the lines of, of a lot of what Todd just covered, Mike, I want to kick it over to you. You know, in terms of programmatic advertising specifically, you know, what's changed in the last few months? And that's obviously going to vary by vertical or, or KPI, but are there any, you know, kind of larger themes that, that you're seeing on, on the DSP side? Yeah. So, you know, coming out of the gate with this happening at Media Math, we realized, you know, this was going to be a large thing. And we obviously saw a huge real back in spend. And what we started doing was monitoring changes closely. And we actually created a microsite at um, Media Math. It's, uh, for, it's COVID-19 specific. It's mediamath.com forward slash COVID-19. It's really cool. So we update it, I'd say at least every month um, with all, all different verticals, all different channels. Um, so what I did is I went there right before this um, round table, kind of took away three call outs that I've noticed right now. Um, the first one being there's that immediate shift in consumer behavior. Um, with that, I mean, obviously video streaming, like we we're just talking about, video consumption is way up. Um, In-app usage is, is up as well, largely in entertainment and e-commerce sector. Uh, time spent consuming just internet in general is up 35% with majority of that traffic going to e-commerce, grocery, household sectors. Just, you know, like, like what they were saying, uh, Todd was saying, your everyday life has changed and how have companies changed with it and what can you use to just simply shop and just get, get by, especially me having three kids. How do I get food? How do I get, you know, school supplies and everything you need? Um, and second, the, the media landscape has altered. Um, the biggest shift we've seen in our own platform is the supply and demand specifically for CTV. Um, many br at the, right at the beginning, I think there was a huge halt. So it was, you know, right at the end of a, right at the end of Q1, budgets just con completely got wiped out, just not because they didn't have it, but they didn't know what to do. They were waiting to see. Um, so within that pullback, there's fewer advertisers in the CTV channel, but then you have to realize there's a huge viewership. So supply and demand is just totally in opposites, which caused CPMs to drastically just drop. And we actually have a graph on our COVID site and you could see right about March 16th, it just tanks in CPMs prices. So um, we did see a, a big drop across the board in all channels, but it was most significant in CTV. So third and, and final, how do marketers, how do they respond to this shift? Um, you know, we, we definitely saw them, if they were able to take advantage and expand into OTT and CTV. Um, so budgets were increasing there. Um, and then also if they were already spending in that channel, we saw them kind of double down on those efforts. Um, a lot of the industries that we saw doing that were ones that were worth okay in this climate. So a lot of internet security industries, um, we had a huge shift. So Uber is one of our clients and obviously ride sharing was halted. So they stopped all spend with that sec section, but they flipped all the budgets into Uber Eats. So then Uber Eats became that big, big section in CTV and then all the down funnel events. Um, but then also a big suspension on a lot of location targeting campaigns. So they halted all that because obviously people are not out walking around going to stores. So if they're able to take that budget and, and then reinvest maybe in in-app or CTV. Got it. And to, to quickly put you on the spot for anyone at home taking notes, if you had to recap those, you know, three major takeaways, you know, what would you, what would be the one line summary for that? Is in like, uh, what is all those three together combined? 
or, or you uh, know, like I, I, yeah. I think the, the first one might have been, you know, everything about how our day to day lives is changing. So how right. would you just recap if I was taking like, oh, boom, these are the three notes I want to remember from that. Yeah, I would say, you know, kind of watching what consumer behavior is doing and then obviously taking that and then investing within the channel that you see. So with CTV, viewership is up. So kind of following the trends that you're seeing happen with either stay at homes as restrictions start to get eased, eased, pay attention to that. And then look at the channels that would be most effective for that, getting your, your message in front of your audience. Love that. Michael, quick question. You had mentioned CPMs dropping and I was reading the other day that in an attempt to keep you know, CPMs at the level with which they are right right now, or I should say pre-pandemic, mm -hmm. a lot of publishers were actually pulling inventory that would be available in the open marketplace out of the open marketplace. Um, and, you know, with increased online usage, we would imagine that not only are CPMs dropping, but more inventory would be available, but it seems like publishers are doing everything in their power to make um, both CPMs not drop and secondly, inventory not more available or is there sort of like a game of cat and mouse happening? You guys sit right in between, you know, the advertiser and the publishers. And, you know, what is the, the foresight that you might have, you know, heading into Q3 with that? Yeah, I, I don't know too much on the publisher side. Um, I do see that when there was an immediate drop, it bounced right back up. So it never went as far back up to where they used to be as in, in regards to all channels. Um, so there was a huge drop and then a level off, which is probably what you're saying, right? Publishers probably right. try to pull back on that supply to kind of level things out because obviously they have their bare minimum. They don't want to be selling their CPMs at sub, you know, uh, at a loss essentially. So right. I'm sure that did happen, which is how you can kind of see that bit of a level off. And then now I feel like there's brands that are dipping their toes in channels that they would have never been able to afford. So I see it as a good thing overall, because now mm -hmm. people get to, you know, kind of play with either CTV, which is historically very expensive um, and see if that is a channel that actually drives outcomes for them. Hmm. Nice. And Michael, what I did like about your summary is it transitions perfectly into our next question, almost like we designed it that way. Uh, but Lauren, for you, like, what are we seeing in terms of, uh, you know, shifts in, either messaging overall or channel specific messaging. Let's start with that. Like how is messaging changing? Yeah, I mean, messaging is a really sensitive topic right now. I think a lot of advertisers are scared to be messaging right now. It can, you know, come off as tone deaf or um, inapplicable to what's happening in the country right now. And, and to be clear, there's two very different things happening. There is a global pandemic that's been happening for months. And then in about the past month or so, there's been, you know, national protests over social injustice and police brutality and, and police violence. And so, you know, what's very interesting to see, and I think, um, you know, very positive is that large brands for the first time ever took a step forward into what is a generally politicized issue and, and made, you know, made a stand and, you know, swore solidarity with Black Lives Matter and, and other, you know, groups that are being marginalized in the United States. That was definitely a precedent that you know wasn't expected from major corporations and historically they have never gone forward with doing in the past um, but obviously a lot of that was met with the call out culture right now of, of you know will give us measurable instances in which you're matching this message and be sincere and i think um, what we really learned from that is is a few different things first and foremost make sure that you are not being tone deaf in your messaging whatever you are putting out there make sure it matches one, what your business is projecting, and two, whatever you're promising the consumer, because consumers will call you out if what you are saying doesn't match your organization, your product, the way that you source your product, and so forth. Um, I think another thing is too, though, um, is you can't ignore what's happening and be silent either. I mean, first and foremost, from a business revenue standpoint, whenever you cut off your upper funnel, whenever you stop marketing, the revenue impact isn't just immediate, which you will see immediate impact, it's long term. And depending on your sales cycle, it could, it could honestly reverberate over the next six, six months to a year to two years. So, you know, the, the goal isn't for people to turn off right now. The goal is for people to utilize data to inform their messaging decisioning and understand the right ways to go about speaking to their consumer. And I think people think about creative as it's really like ethereal experience where, you know, creative minds put together messaging and who knows how it's going to be perceived. And that's not the case with creative at all. There is a ton of data right now 
about how brands should be messaging, what brands are being perceived as messaging from a positive perspective, what type of messaging is really, um, you know, working for the consumers in this environment. And there's also a ton of tools that advertisers can use if they are nervous and they do want to assess risk with the messaging they're about to put out. I mean, everything from MTurk, which is just, you know, Amazon surveys where you could test different creative messaging to Cantor Millard Brown and Zappi and all of these brand studies that you can do pre-launch with, you know, focus groups. And you don't need a ton of money to do it. They're not entirely expensive. So rather than go dark in a time when your consumers should hear from you most, especially when the consumer is hearing from competitors, think about your messaging, utilize data to inform your decisioning and assess the risk or the messaging that you might be putting out there by the utilization of tools. And I think there's some really good stats. I'll, I'll read off a couple really quickly just to you know, alleviate any brands or, or advertisers on the call that don't agree that, that they should be messaging right now. I mean, 56% of consumers recently said that they are very interested in understanding brands COVID-19 initiatives. So not only do they want you to advertise, they want you to advertise and tell you what they are doing to address the global pandemic. Um, another great one is, you know, when you talk about attitudes towards companies and brands that are using, we're in this together messaging around COVID-19, um, on average, 47% of, of consumers found that they genuinely feel that the brand is caring about the community when they put out that message. Um, and then only 15% were like unsure how they really felt and 38 were negative. So when you have, you know, 47% having a very positive impact through that type of messaging and only 38 not, you have to ask yourself, you know, what makes a bigger impact, you know, for your business and also for the longevity and, and frankly, you know, the hindsight that's going to come when we all get out of this in terms of your brand messaging and, and your initiatives that you've been taking. And um, I, I should give Todd a call out here. Um, Media Radar is one of our partners and they've actually been phenomenal at providing us with like weekly updates about how brand creative is changing, what different brands are doing, um, how the spend is being influenced and, and messaging is being influenced in tandem with increased and decreased spends. So um, they give us really high level oversight on all of these different brands and what they're doing. And we in turn can then inform our advertisers to do the same. That's great. And Todd, another great transition, because I'm going to pass it back to you. Um, I love the spot, obviously, you sit in with how many different types of brands and companies, you know, Media Radar gets to work with. Um, we've talked about how our lifestyles change. We've talked about how messaging has changed. Uh, what are you seeing in terms of marketing budgets? How are they shifting? Might be on mute still. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> a, uh, some of the trends we're seeing certainly echo some of your thoughts, Mike. Um, you know, we, we see m the biggest change, just very big picture, is that we see way more advertising in digital. Huh. I mean, it's true in consumer media, B2B media, science media, like wherever media is, we have seen a flight out of traditional formats and into digital. And certainly OTT is and, and connected TV is a, a big beneficiary of that. Like I, I thought it was not a surprise when we saw that Google and YouTube essentially, especially YouTube is, is saying like the audience viewership is way up. Their advertising is probably not going to be that dramatically uh, impacted by all this. They're, they're worried about it in a huge way and they are large enough that they're a little bit of a bellwether for the, for the whole industry. Uh, but we have seen in terms of the, the volume of advertising, without any question, uh, we have seen it move there. Now, there is definitely a good debate about the role of advertising in linear television and in broadcast and cable. You know, you have some of these broadcasters who really had an awful time at the beginning, right? NBC was, was losing the NCAA. They were losing uh, basketball and hockey and MLB. It's like, this was a major part of their programming calendar. And then of course the Olympics. Um, and while many companies we saw contracted their ad spend, many others just simply moved dollars to somewhere else. And the fastest way to deploy that capital was, was online and connected TV is certainly an OTT fits really nicely with that. 
That said, we have seen the pendulum starting to swing back in the last couple of weeks, where we're starting to see a lot more advertising in linear television again, and the programming calendar, while it may not be standard or normal, it's being put back together, right? It, back in end of March and April, it's just like a, an asteroid hit and just destroyed people's programming. And you couldn't even go out and run and get new shows created. <laughs> you know, this is, this is a very, very tough situation if you were still trying to create new content to fill your pipe for the, <laughs> for the late spring and, and summer. But we are starting to see a meaningful shift back just in the last couple of weeks. So that has been interesting to us. But, uh, you know, certainly we see, you know, I was just pulling up some, I was just looking at some slides, like things that you, that we would not have predicted in terms of these marketing trends. Like some of them are media format driven, but we continue to see also format driven permanent changes around things like, skincare advertising is is just be, because skin it doesn't seem to do it that it's actually the summertime it's it's like way up over the prior year some of it's just because it has uh it, that there are there's a lot of marketing about it basically around health and uh that we see that manifest in automa automotive manufacture in automotive advertising it's like come into your car as your escape your respite your safe place same thing with, with products, uh, same thing. It's like, use this skincare because it's good for you. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no overstatement that it like protects you from viruses. It's just, but like that it is healthy and keeps you clean. We're seeing that as a, a theme without any question over the last, over the last couple months. And for sure, I would also end or talk about just on this point around travel. And, and maybe this next week will be different, but we have seen tourism local tourism advertising like come visit florida come to las vegas that is up in a big way and back but the messaging is quite different the messaging now is you know las vegas isn't marketing everywhere in the country it's like states that can drive to vegas same thing with state of california san diego florida it's like a lot of that advertising used to be absolutely everywhere now it's like if you're within a one-day drive of us you know, come visit us, we're open for business. And again, that may not be the story next week when we look at the advertising, especially in Florida, sadly. But I, I do think many states are saying, look, we, we're safe enough and we're gonna give it a go. That's what we see in the messaging for sure. Sure. So I, Michael, I let me- I really wanna pile on something on the linear piece too, because it, you brought up a good point. Um, we, when we, when this first started, I was mentioning CTV and how everyone kind of tried to pour the their, their budgets into that channel. Um, we, we actually are seeing a shift as well in the last few weeks of them going, putting the brakes on and saying, wait, I'm buying linear right now. This makes sense. And we're all for it because the way I feel it is take that, bud, that linear budget as an awareness piece. And then we, you can use data from like Inscape that we're integrated with and actually use that to retarget against. So we're seeing users or we're seeing uh, clients still use their linear as that upper funnel approach and then take that knowledge to then see users maybe conquesting or people that have seen that commercial and then retarget them through display and video down into mid funnel campaigns. Interesting. Well, I may want to dive back to that, but before we do, if I'm an advertiser or a brand or a marketer or a mom and pop shop, uh, Michael, I want to kick this question to you. Like, what can I do to, to react in real time? Like, how can I stay on top of consumer trends or messaging trends or to, to Todd's point, Hey, tourism's back this week, but like, how long is that going to last? Like, how, how can I stay on top of it and not either miss an opportunity or be spending where I probably shouldn't be spending? Yeah. I mean, it's a great question and things, they move so fast. Like, like we were saying, literally, I think before we were, we would base things off of quarter by quarter or even month by month. And now they're literally like week by week changes that we're seeing. Um, I, first and foremost, I would say if you're already investing in programmatic, um, you know, programmatic is driven by data. It's driven by outcomes, right? Let the brain do its thing. Let, you know, if it's done right and executed properly, programmatic should kind of give you hints at to where things are going. So kind of rely on that messaging, but also stay, you know, pay close attention to trends that you're seeing, behavior patterns, consumers, you know, where they're, where they're consuming media, um, you know, what shifts are happening. And then once you've kind of figured that out, um, 
and you want to test a new channel or you want to test even programmatic, like do it, uh, you know, make sure that you do it in a smart way and that you set up your frameworks for your new channels. Um, you know, I like, I'm a big fan of the whole funnel approach, right? Like set up your messaging, set up sequential messaging across each channel so that you can capture that user's journey. And then that way you can kind of see what your users are doing, what, where they're converting, where they're not converting, where they're dropping off. Then you can make those decisions in real time and then, and then shift as need be. Interesting. I like that. Uh, I do know there's a whole different school of thought between, are we looking conversion funnel? Are we looking uh, consumer decision journey? Is it some combination? Is it cross channel where you've got one funnel that's got three different channels you want to incorporate? Um, I'm a fan of, trying to pick one for the situation, but I, I think it's one of those, like do what you understand and do what works best for you. But as long as you're planning, you're probably uh, taking the right step forward. Yeah, and then another thing too, to keep in mind too, like if you're planning on mobile, like keep in mind, there's that shift that's going to happen in Q, end of Q3, Q4 with the IDFA removal. So that's a whole nother thing to keep aware of that if you're doing retargeting in mobile, that may change depending on how um, that, you know, the MMPs react to that. Yep, good call out. Um, so Lauren, actually taking that into consideration, right? Tracking may be changing. We've talked about consumer habits changing, how are marketing changing, how are marketing objectives changing? Like what are KPIs? How are we, how do we know that what we're doing is or is not working? Yeah, I, I would say one of the really interesting things that has happened over the past few months is as people have really digitalized their businesses, I, you know, and we've talked about it and hinted at it a lot. People were taking linear TV budgets and funneling them into CTV. People were taking, you know, digital or you know, out of home budgets and and moving them into digital mediums and all of these more traditional um, means of advertising. Print is is definitely, you know, not doing as well. People don't want to touch their mail. People don't want to be mm -hmm. sorting through things, especially in the beginning stages of the pandemic when we weren't sure. You know, everyone's wiping down their groceries and we're not sure what we should be touching or or how things were really. Um, you know, infection was being spread. So I think one of the key things we noticed as everyone moved into the digital space and, and really digitalized their budgets was there's more measurable um, KPIs and objectives that exist in the digital framework. Um, obviously, there are a lot of traditional metrics to, to measure, you know, traditional forms of advertising, and they're great. Um, but they're, you know, they're less um, action-based, you know, metrics. And I think, you know, we talked about the funnel and, and I think that the funnel really stays the same, right? You have awareness, consideration, decisioning, and then generally some sort of an action. And then that's, that's generally how a consumer moves through to a purchase. How quickly they do though, and what the consumer journey looks like within that funnel is completely nonlinear. And um, I think as people digitalized, it became, easier to measure what does my consumer journey actually look like. Um, and when you create a, you know, a seamless omni-channel campaign and you can actually look at the user and, you know, they watched this ad on CTV, they were retargeted on mobile and clicked on the ad. They went to the site and they bounced. Then they were retargeted later on with new messaging. They went on, they got to shopping cart and they abandoned my shopping cart to finally come back and make the purchase three days later. Or, you know, even, even brands that are a little less sophisticated than that, just look at your Google sessions. When you go to Google Analytics, there's a way that you can see the average number of sessions to conversion. And I think that's, that's even a metric that's so easy that exists for anyone using Google Analytics. And it really starts to open advertisers' eyes because sometimes it's like 26 Google sessions before a purchase. And they're like, there is no way that, that it takes that many times. And, and the reality is it, it is and it does. And I think people who were, you know, historically more, um, you know, I would say hesitant to move into digital spaces are now starting to understand the significance of it. I mean, people used to be like, search and social makes sense. It's a last click model. I see my attribution. It's so clear as day. But the reality is those are more expensive channels that do generally convert on a last touch basis, but they're also more expensive on a CPM, CPC basis. And they're not great for driving awareness and upper funnel consideration. And so the utilization of programmatic in tandem with last click attribution models and also, you know, more brand awareness channels once traditional does become, you know, more relevant again to our everyday, you know, they all work in tandem together. And there's a place for each of these different channels in that consumer journey. And it's important that advertisers, when we go back to normal, don't abandon digital um, and don't sort of give up all of the data and all of the tools that they've really gained during this time. 
And so in terms of, of, of objectives, I would just say, you know, KPIs can remain relevant, but it's very important that you decide which channel is going to have, you know, which place in each stage. So if you want to utilize search and social, definitely make that part of that decisioning phase of the funnel and make attribution for the conversion, your KPI and your metric and objective. For programmatic, if you're running CTV or you know, programmatic audio, make that part of your awareness and consideration phase. And if you don't like listen through rate or click through rate as, as sort of a, a top line KPI, plug in a Nielsen brand study or uh, a Cantor Miller Brown brand study and figure out what the awareness and consideration is for your brand now against a competitive set who's also advertising online. Find whatever KPI will make your CEO agree with your CMO <laughs> and keep you know, investing in the marketing and advertising dollars. But you know, also look to your partners like Media Math or Audience X and whoever it is that you're working with and help them create that narrative and that story for you because there's objectives at every level um, and tying those objectives together isn't always easy, but it's you know, people like us, it's, it's our job to to help you create that narrative, to get the larger investment, to continue to drive business revenue goals and, and long-term growth and success for your company, not just in the advertising space, but also like your actual business needs as a company. Hmm. I love that. The, the one thing that I'll, I'll call out from that and it's a question that we get asked about a lot is, hey, it feels like I should get an MTA or a marketing mix model <laughs> or multi-touch attribution solution. Yes. Um, uh, as a huge data nerd, love having those conversations the analogy I use for most marketers is getting an MTA solution to answer some simple questions would be like buying a Formula One car to get to work. It'll get you from, from point A to point B, but it might not be the most effective way to do that. Um, so yeah. if you do have questions about MTA or, or marketing mix models, happy to talk through them, maybe separately outside of this, because that's a whole rabbit hole. Um, but a lot of what you hit on, I think, as yeah. there, there are people like, oh, cool, I need to go get a solution to help me do just that. And the answer is there are free tools that can help you do that. I think too, it's, it's funny you mentioned MTA because you can even just dedupe through most channels. I would say Facebook is the one channel that is just the most difficult in terms of walled <laughs> garden. Um, it, they just give the least amount of data and they make it as difficult as possible, purposely so because it makes their data look better. Um, but when you're working with search and programmatic and other channels, if you have, you know, a parameterized pixel place and you have a unique order ID, you can simply download the reports from each of your individual platform partners and dedupe. Um, you know, where am I getting double duplication for these conversions? Because when you look at Google Analytics or whatever web analytics tool you're using, there will be a singular report or even your POS system. It'll say this is the order ID. This is how much and this is who it is. Okay. So, you know, even though, you know, you know, you get your report from Media Math and it says I had 100 purchases and then you get your um, paid search, you know, uh, report and it says 50 purchases and you're like, well, I only had 100, not 150. So, you know, what's what's going on here? It's very easy to take those two reports and just do a matchup in Google Sheets and figure out where am I duplicating, you know, attribution. And then you can actually go to your UTM codes and figure out who actually drove the last touch or maybe the first touch or, or any of those sorts of metrics that matter. You don't need to go with visual IQ or, or these like massively expensive long-term investment MTA solution options to answer simple questions like you said, Joe, which is where am I duplicating, you know, my conversion attribution, which is generally what people really want to know, not necessarily like how many touches and who was responsible for first and who was last and how do I want to attribute 30% to them. That's not what people want to know. They just want to know, you know, why is it showing 150 when I, when I see it's a hundred in my POS system? Um, yeah. And that, that you don't have to pay for. We, we all have the tools and brains to do that ourselves. <laughs> we just sure. might not know how to do it. Yeah. So we've, we've talked about a lot here in 35 ish minutes. Um, <laughs> but I do want to ask a group question. So Todd, I'm going to start with you, which means you're on the hot seat, Michael and Lauren, you guys get some prep time here. Um, but if you had to, you know, almost closing thoughts, you know, what should marketers be thinking about in relation to strategies, everything we've talked about, what should they be thinking about as we go into Q3 and Q4? So uh, certainly I think the, the discussion around messaging is, is more important than, than ever. Uh, Lauren, you talked about this a lot and it's something that we're studying a lot at Media Radar. Uh, you know, the taste of the consumer is, is shifting at a much faster pace than we're accustomed to. 
And, you know, Joe, you talked about it, like in the last couple of weeks, we've started to see very few, like we're with you on the front lines ads and we're moving to this next stage. Um, I think people are sensitive to, to authenticity more than ever. They can smell it. They can, they can, they can know if you're, if you're full of it or not. And so at first we thought, like I can remember back in March, we thought, God, Verizon was so on top of this. They were like, they had their new creative prepped in English and in Spanish, ready to go like March, the first week of March. But even three months into it, we do not see new creative at more than, I want to say at most half in most market segments. And so in terms of advice is most brands really need to, they do need to adjust their creative. The issue is not the, those automotive ones who are on their fifth iteration. It's actually all of the companies that are still running creative from January now, and it's feeling dated. And I think the penalty, the risk for a marketer is the penalty now for old creative could be meaningful. Interesting. Michael, what about you? From a, a DSP, you know, what are you guys seeing? What should marketers be thinking about as we head into Q3, Q4? Yeah, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. You know, we keep talking how the shifts are happening so fast, so rapidly. So there's not kind of one thing you can do. And I think, you know, it's even pocket. It's even state by state, county by county. There's different things happening. Restrictions are, you know, easing and they're coming back. So I think, you know, a return to normal is going to be gradual and there's going to be a new normal. So kind of paying attention to those trends. Um, like we're seeing the growth among in app environment, people are able to get their everyday things through apps now. So is that where you want to, to place your messaging and messaging is very important. Um, you know, we, I, I expect to see a continuation with limited access to going to stores. So digital connectivity is going to be huge. Um, consumers have a greater motivation to seek those technology enabled solutions, again, helping them with those daily tasks. I think, um, the, in the consumer kind of where they're going now with everything, transparency is huge. So mm. they want those messages that are going to provide a quality assur assurance for them, knowing that, you know, they're getting a, maybe a guarantee on what they're buying. They really trust the product. Um, so messaging is, is very important in making that user feel comfortable. I think that's going to rely how that's why I think users are going to evaluate their purchases is based on, do I trust this brand? Is this brand, you know, providing me full transparency and everything I'm getting? Um, you know, yes. Okay. I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to make that purchase. So kind of, i again, what Todd said, I think messaging is very powerful. And then obviously tying that in with all the consumer trends and, and the digital connectivity. Got it. Uh, Lauren, before I pass to you, obviously anyone listening, if you guys do have questions, if you want to pick our brains while you've, you've got us on in front of you, feel free to use the chat. Um, we've got a couple other questions I would love to be able to ask, so maybe we'll go to that as well. Uh, but just want to remind everyone the chat is still there. Um, and Lauren, let's, let's pass to you. What do you think for marketers, Q3? What are they, what are they thinking about? What's top of mind? Yeah, so I'll pick it up from the other the other two on the call and, and say messaging is definitely going to be key. I think there's a couple components of messaging that we might not have touched on yet. Um, one of which is frequency fatigue. You know, we are being bombarded right now in our homes. We're on our screens, but that just means more ads, more ads, more ads. <laughs> um, and so I think, you know, one of the things that is important is that you ensure as, as you create omni-channel strategies, um, that you're not over, you know, advertising to these individual consumers that might be interested in your brand because there is a fatigue and then there's a negative effect following the fatigue and it has nothing to do actually with the messaging so much as it has to do with the fact that they are just sick of you. Like they don't want to see it anymore. And I think we've all been there when we're watching like a, you know, a show online or YouTube channel and all of a sudden it's like the same ad at every ad break and you're just like I get it Pantene like I need to wash my hair but we're in quarantine and I don't want to like <laughs> you know I just I don't want it anymore I get it I'll buy shampoo but I think um you know that that's important is is there is a fatigue and we're all feeling tired naturally because of a pandemic because of you know all of the social unrest that's happening and the last thing people want is for their advertising to you know the advertisers to make them feel tired <laughs> and overwhelmed um, I think the other thing is, you know, tailor your messaging to the environment and to the content that the consumer is actually engaging with in that moment. And I think there's so many really cool examples of this. Um, you know, we recently have been making a lot of weather uh, 
respondent ads. So if it's a rainy day outside, the ad will show, you know, a rainy visual of the creative. If it's sunny, it's sunny. But I think it just, these types of things, they seem really trivial and really small, but they really resonate more with the consumer because it says that, you know, you're taking the time to approach them. You understand where they're at and you're trying to engage with them in a meaningful way. And, and so we've seen a lot of native um, positive, positive impact, you know, higher um, KPIs, better conversion rates, better CTRs, because native is a very innate environment for people. And it feels like a natural progression in their, you know, in the content that they're consuming to then go engage with your content. And so I think, um, you know, obviously there's like the, the key things we need to think about is like, is it tone appropriate? It, is it matching the need of the consumers to feel accountability and for your messaging to match the current state of affairs? But Beyond that, it's also trying to reach the consumers as an individual and where they're at in their journey. And so, you know, you can't think about one and not think about the other, or you'll still miss the mark in the middle. Sure. Thanks, Lauren, and, and everybody for that. Um, we've got a couple questions trickling in. Todd, I want to throw this first one to you. Uh, obviously, Michael, Lauren, if you guys want to chime in as well, feel free. You know, but what is the top advice that you would give to direct response or DR advertisers? Todd, you may be on mute again. Todd, you're on mute. <laughs> Whoever is the person who asked this question, um, Paul, uh, look, you know, you're doing a lot of testing already. We saw a major uh, decline in the number of DR brands buying, actually. Um, you know, they're thinking about there are more than like 1,500 D2C companies that do a lot of DR themselves. Uh, we saw that number cut in half almost immediately since April, and it has not really come back all the way at all. Um, so we, one, we've observed there there were a lot of companies that had funding, and 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 if if the numbers weren't going to work out, they just they they left. But just over the last few weeks, we've seen a lot of it come back, and it's coming back in very DR friendly environments. So, for example, in podcasting, for example, which we track a lot. Uh, about half of podcasting is DR advertising. We've seen a, a, a return to sort of, I'll call them DR friendly environments. Even in, in monthly magazines, we've seen DR pick up. Um, and so I guess in terms of advice, you, you know it already, but just testing shorter buys, just the way we, 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 you would normally imagine it for DR. Uh, but certainly we've, we've heard that pricing is more affordable as a buyer of, of these ads, certainly there is a lot of inventory for sale and that's good for DR. Hmm. Yeah, I, I wanna chime in, you know, for DR advertisers, I think the key right now is to understand your product's place in the pandemic market. And so I think, you know, DR advertisers are incredibly data-driven, probably the most so of any advertising, uh, you know, industry or sector that we see. Um, but with that also comes, you know, very stringent uh, KPIs and, and uh, you know, expectations for the partners that they work with. And, you know, some things are just not going to be realistic. You know, if your product is beach chairs and umbrellas and you're, you know, all the beaches are closed, you know, there's going to be an impact on the revenue and, you know, the ROAS or, or CPA that you generally see. And so I think, the key thing is to be realistic about, you know, your product in the pandemic market, and then in doing so, create level set expectations and new KPI benchmarks for this time, and know that stopping advertising again, and I mentioned this earlier, is going to affect and have, you know, a reverberating effect for many, many months to come. So simply turning off your advertising and, and going dark during this period is very much so not the answer. You need to continue to stay top of mind. You need to be, you know, hitting these consumers while they're in the awareness and consideration phase. Because just because the LA beach is closed on the 4th of July doesn't mean that I might not still be looking at beach umbrellas and chairs for mm -hmm. a month from now. And I might be looking for great sales because I know now might be the time to buy because those industries might be impacted. So, you know, continue to invest, be realistic about your investments and, you know, hold your partners accountable to the new benchmarks and the new realities um, and ensure that they're helping you with messaging and testing and all of these other things and use the time to your advantage. I mean, again, like, you know, maybe you guys have always done something a certain way and it's always worked, but, you know, while you're setting new expectations, why not try new channels? Why not see if things that 
you've historically not had the opportunity to test could work for you. And if not, great, you check the box, but you know, you might be surprised with what you learn in terms of new audiences, new demographics, new channels. Well, I'll dive in there too for a bit, just to pile on. I also don't get too stuck on, on, on the data. Data is a big piece of DR, but don't get too stuck in certain audience segments. Don't be afraid to invest in prospecting to figure out where those users are going and, and learn from that and then take that into your mid funnel tactics. Um, and then obviously, you know, that way you can play with messaging use. If you're doing search, that's, you could very much learn from how people are accessing your, your website. Now there might be changes in keywords of people landing on your website. So use Google analytics in that sense and have that feed your prospecting and remarketing. And Lauren and Michael, maybe a little bit on what you just said. I've been using my beach chair a lot recently. It's the best way for me to get a uh, sun on my apartment's roof. So I, I'm not taking it to the beach. There's no sand, but it's, it's getting more use than regular, especially during a uh, quarantine. Yeah, I think, I think too, DR advertisers might be surprised by some of the metrics that they're seeing. I think beauty has been one of the, one of the craziest uh, examples of that is people were like, people are going inside, no one's wearing makeup, no one's gonna care about beauty. And it's like the exact opposite has happened. It's like people are more interested in like makeup webinars and like um, YouTube tutorials. People care the most about makeup right now and face masks and skincare and all of this stuff because they have time for self care. So you know, you never know what's going to happen and you never know what your place might be. Like to Joe's point, maybe people are needing the beach chair for their balcony because that's yeah. the only way they're getting sun. But, um, you know, test and, and learn and set, set new benchmarks. Also pay attention to what activities are in your county or where your marketing are being eased because so Callaway is one of my clients and they're investing heavily right now because golf is something that people can yeah. do. Right. Mm -hmm. However, they have a problem right now that they've never had before. They're out of supply. Like they are selling so fast that they can't keep up. Yeah. But where our biggest conversation with them was always like, you got to expand on your audience. Golfers now are people that have never want, ever thought they would be a golfer, but they want to get out and do something. So to, to really kind of don't just be stuck in your pigeonhole with who you think your audience is. It, it's going to be bigger right now. Um, with, with kind of new people testing new different activities. Sure. We've got a few more questions and a few more minutes. Let's see how many we can go through. Todd, we've got another hopefully quick one for you. Um, do you cover APAC media spend insights on social native search, audio, programmatic, OTT, et cetera? Um, hopefully you know what only APAC in, is. So the answer <laughs> is yes, but only in some segments. So uh, T, if we could speak off, offline and, and discuss what's there, but it's, I don't want to overstate. We're, we're very focused on US and Canada, but we have global coverage in certain categories, for example, like in beauty and fashion uh, business. Perfect. Uh, Michael, another one from the chat, then I'm going to start with you. Uh, where could sustainability fit in today's messaging? Uh, obviously one of the, benefactors of uh, everyone staying inside is global warming and some of the uh, you know, CO2 emissions with people driving less. Um, what are you guys seeing in terms of either sustainability uh, or even a little bit broader with um, you know, cause messaging? Like, what does that look like? How does that fit in with, with the landscape today? I, I don't know offhand too many um, in, in that sense, but I totally agree. I think that is a big um, you know, side effect that we are seeing and it's a good thing. And, and, and I think we should learn from it, right? Like, I also think it's, it's going to change everything around that sense, even involving real estate. So I have, I live outside of San Francisco and I live about 20 miles North and we're seeing a huge boom of people that are moving out of the city because they feel like they're not going to have to commute into work as much anymore. Even it might be for companies, they might have to go in one day a week, two days a week, Again, that's a sustainability thing and, and less cars on the road. Mm -hmm. So are people going to be you know, selling their cars and then using trains to get into work once a day? Uh, where I live, there's no BART to get you into the city. So a lot of people weren't driven up here, but now they're like, well, I don't have to go into the city. So um, it is a, an area for me. So uh, I think it is important to you know, kind of capitalize on that um, in, in the sense of what is sustainable for, for, that, for Joe's product there in, in the sense that does it fit in with with um, the times now and, and people that are using less things that are harmful for, 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 the, um, for the earth. Sure. Yeah, we, we've seen a really positive um, impact from that. And, you know, Joe, I'd be happy 
to share some data with you offline from eMarketer around cause messaging. Um, I will, you know, sort of echo something that Todd did say earlier, though, which is authenticity in doing so. So, you know, it, it can be very powerful. It can have a really positive impact if you, you know, go out to market with cause messaging. But, you know, the key is ensuring that there's authenticity behind it and, you know, accountability for your brand behind it. Um, and if those two can align, you can, you know, have a really, really positive um, reception in market for it. Well, I think there may be a few other questions, but I'm worried it may take us a little bit longer than three minutes to answer them. I do want to start by saying thank you to all of our panelists for taking time out of your day to, to jump in and talk to us about everything that is Q3, COVID, what we can be doing, how we can be marketing more effectively. Uh, thanks to everyone who tuned in. Um, hopefully you took something away. If you do have follow-up questions, uh, obviously feel free to reach out to um, kind of any of the panelists here. Uh, again, we'll be sending out the recording and, and hopefully you all are staying safe and uh, doing well in quarantine. Thank Thanks you. everyone. Awesome. Take care. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.